Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and the beginning of Channel Islands at War Week. And I have to say, about four hours ago, I wasn't sure I was even going to make it here today because I did something I've never done in 20 years living in Normandy. I got my van stuck in a ditch, a proper bull, full-blown, two feet deep, two right-hand wheels went well and truly in this ditch there. I was stuck for about an hour and a bit, and I was, but I got towed out by a friendly guy with a 4 by 4 fine, so I made it. So the Channel Islands at War, um, before I bring my guest in, I can't believe after two years of programming, we've never really tackled the Channel Islands. It's come up a little bit. We talked a little bit about the commando orders. It's come up a little bit in terms of, of, of a side discussion. We've never devoted an entire week to it. And in fact, I've just realized I will need to devote another week to it in the future. But what we're going to start with, we're going to start with um, our guest today, Phil Merritt, is a tour guide like me, but he's also a historian, and he also has, is involved in an incredibly worthwhile project to scan, research, and look into the preservation, the long-term future of the Atlantic Wall in Jersey particularly, but also he does work in Normandy as well. So as always, folks, all the links you need are in the description below. You can pull back and find Phil's website, Jersey, uh, the Jersey, the tours in Jersey, and all the links there to his project there. But I'm going to bring Phil in now. So good evening, Phil. How are you today? Hey, Paul. Yeah, good, thanks. How are you? I'm I'm good. Now I'm recovered from Ditchgate. But um, so my my introduction there, you know, you, I, I like people like yourself who wear who wear many multiple hats because coming at World War II from different angles gives you different perspectives. So explaining the history to clients on tours, you have to learn a set of, set of skills to do that. To explain the background of how to explain them, you have to dis discover the sites yourself. So you have to spend lots of time on the ground in, in the sites you then talk about. And then, of course, you're adding to our knowledge about these sites because of your work scanning and, and looking into these, these positions. Because and I'll let you explain in a minute. Jersey and the Channel Islands just has an insane amount of German defenses beyond, you know, per square, you know, per mile of coastline. I'm, I think I'm correct in saying it's about the most fortified section of the entire Atlantic Wall. But tell me, how did you get interested in just World War II to begin with? And, and how did you kind of hone in on this angle of getting deeply interested in the, in the Atlantic Wall? Yeah, it, it's a little, little bit of a mistake at times, as all good things are. Um, we just started between me and a group of friends researching, as you do after watching Private Ryan and everything else. Sorry to drop those words on you. But you get hooked and you start looking into the history and then you kind of, living on Jersey, you remember that you're surrounded by that history. Um, so we started to look at what our grandparents did and um, how they were affected by the war, all the way through to remembering that we grew up playing in bunkers, which isn't always what other people do. Um, mm. So we started looking at it and then you know, using Facebook, we started to share photos of going into the bunkers and people started to react, you know, and um, we just started building it up. We were really struggling to find things online, uh, any data about it. And as all of these things, it's in books or in people's heads or, or elsewhere. So we just started to take a more technical view of it. Um, we kind of all work around the technology industry. So we started to think of ways of sharing the information and you know using things like drone footage using things like video walkthroughs simple things that suddenly people were asking us how do i get in how do i go and have a look um so about eight years ago we were getting harassed a lot on facebook about well can you take me to this site at night or can you meet me here or as i'm sure you get the same kind of questions um and we started doing it but it felt weird because we were taking you know people offering us money and so we decided to do something with it so we set up Jersey War Tours as a non-profit and we took the money and invested it in technology or sites. And we started work very early on with drones, filming above, grabbing, capturing the data. Um, and then we moved into kind of 3D scanning uh, after getting a few demos and a few um, workshops with people using this technology. And it's generally used for real estate, the ones we kind of use. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought, well, what a fantastic way of letting someone I don't, in Australia, walk around a bunker in Jersey. Um, and it works a bit like Street View, right? You can just wander around. So we started investing heavily in, in getting into sites, doing that. But then the tours started to become more and more. Um, so we started a schedule of, of tours. So people, once they'd seen them online, even locals would come and want to see the real thing. Um, so we started working with the local groups here. So there's a, a wonderful organization called the Channel Island Occupation Society. 
all volunteers, all opening sites, all digging these bunkers out. So we started to work with them to get into the sites with with the general public. Uh, and they had open days. It's just a lot of people you know, working nine to five meant they'd come out on an evening tour with us and still get to see the bunker firsthand. So we just grew from there. And then we started recording it online. So we started Jersey War Tours as a website. We've got a bunker database there and we're trying to record as much as we can. There's so much here. It's it's ridiculous. It's probably another 10 years worth of work to get it all. Um, and then on top of that, we started to hear these amazing stories. So like the commando raids, um, we, we lived in a world where we kind of thought nothing happened here. And then we started to look at the losses and we thought, hang on, that's a lot of allied forces lost here, uh, either being shot down, uh, sea battles, etc. So we started to look at that and bridge into that. And then at the same time, the human side of it. So we've got slave labor here. There are labor camps set up on Jersey, uh, Guernsey, Sark and Alderney. Um, and we started to look at where they were, how they were involved, uh, which got us to some of the projects we're looking at now. So um, what we did wanted to try and do is not to stand on other people's toes, as it were. So we looked for sites over here that had no one was using them. No one was looking after them. And we picked up three sites under the what we call a license with the government to do more detailed research. Um, so we're doing um, laser and um, a full survey in two big German war tunnels here. One's known as HO19 and one HO5, as well as uh, an old Napoleonic tower, um, which was um, been completely abandoned. And we took it on as a small project. So um, it was Napoleonic and then was very quiet for many years until the Germans created kind of an anti-aircraft position in it. Um, so we look after three sites and we support other people's sites through the tours. Um, but yeah, so, so basically it was, like you said, multiple hats. We learn lots of new skills each day. Um, we weren't professionals of that yet or professional historians, but we're just taking a passion of research and curiosity and sharing it with others. And the great thing is we're not often wrong at times and we're corrected um yeah with, well with facts right it's that discussion we often have about when does someone become a historian and you know i'm the first to admit i haven't got any qualifications for what i do except i've been doing it for a long time but to me when other people start listening to what you're saying when other people are using you as a resource you have become a historian if people are not finding much, much errors with it then you are a historian and you know we'll we'll let you share some screen you've got some stuff you're going to show us what your work is in a minute but I, what's interesting for me is is I'm only a few miles away from the Channel Islands. I'm just on the French part of the coast. Is, but the experience there obviously was completely different. Okay, there was an occupation, but it was the British being occupied as opposed to the French being occupied here in Normandy. And where if if a if a local association in Normandy wanted to start perhaps doing more research and perhaps even restoration of the Atlantic Wall in Normandy there would be some kind of hang on. You can't do that. People died on uh, on those beaches. Well, of course, in the Challenge Islands, nearly all of those bunkers didn't see any action in that sense. I'm not counting there was anti-aircraft, there was your commando raid, but really the Atlantic War wasn't used in that same way. So therefore, maybe it's the better place to use to study what was built. How did the Germans use this tech? What, what, le what depths did they go to literally and figuratively to create these these bunkers. So I think it's about time we, we let you share your screen and brought some stuff there and we can talk about what, what you're up to. And folks, please come in with your questions for Phil about the Channel Lines, about the Atlantic Wall, about things like that. And we'll we'll bring some stuff up here. And I should acknowledge that you may have noticed my video ident. I started being a couple of the photos in there are from Phil's Jersey at War uh, War Tours website because there's some amazing photos there and the Facebook page as well. So I'll kind of hand it over to you, Phil, and then fire away with questions, folks. And um, and I'm looking forward to this because, um, as I said, the understanding of how to preserve and look look at these positions in the future is very important. Just saying, okay, there's bunkers there, but. What, how big were they? What were the problems the Germans had building them? How thick were they? So over to you, Phil. Thank you. Yeah, and um, yeah, so um, we'll go through the slides and uh, and a little bit, as we said. And again, it's not just me. I, I'll point out that um, uh, I co-founded this with uh, Kimberly, who's on screen now and will hate this. So hey, Kimberly. And uh, her husband, Luke, and uh, between the three of us, we're kind of working on the, the digital side of it, as well as the tours. And um, and we're the team that you can annoy through all those links Paul said. Um, yeah, so, yeah, we're here. And I know it seems a bit obvious, but a lot of people don't realize how close we are um, to Normandy. 
Um, so, uh, and also we get a lot of people thinking we're in New Jersey uh, and we're the old one, but uh, across the way from us, um, effectively you can see uh, yeah, Utah Beach and Omaha Beach over there and we're a stone throw away. Um, and, um, you know, some basic numbers just, uh, and again, we'll, we'll try and keep it light um, and I'm sure we can do other shows on anything in depth. Um, but this is kind of a high level, and I may have a few of these wrong, but I just quickly listed as many of the things we could think of. So nine big strong points on Jersey, 87 resistance nests. We had 10 operational posts or action posts, 16 tunnels, which is quite impressive for a little island nine by five, 16 artillery batteries, multiple types, um, but up to 22 centimeter um, caliber. Uh, 37 anti-aircraft batteries, which deserves a show on its own about how they yeah. did not bring anyone down on the American route into to Normandy over uh, D-Day. Um, 32 observation bunkers, uh, 15 slave and forced labor camps, two prisoner of war camps, over 11 headquarter bunkers across hotels to full strong points, um, 28 communication network bunkers uh, with a complete underground telephone network, well over 100 minefields with over 65,000 landmines laid. And um, as of the 1st of December, 44, there was 11,604 troops um, on Jersey. So I think the total in the Channel Islands was probably at its peak, close to 32, 33,000. So largest infantry division they had stuck on a group of islands 12 miles away from the Norman lines is is the way we see it is it's a, a tragic mistake for the Germans because it's helping us get ever closer to victory. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so just in a rough bit. Um, now, this map, hopefully the viewers can see it fairly clearly. It, it's a cluster of stuff. It's a 1943 German map of uh, the progression of the Atlantic Wall in Jersey, let's just say. I'm not even sure if we it's like a separate project it's that vast but everything on this map is what they're planning to do or have done so darkest shading is complete and operational gray shading is kind of operational but not complete and if it's not colored in yet it's just a plan but within this map you can see the focus is on the left and the bottom right kind mm. of side of the map so our west and southwest corner um, north and east and southeast to an extent is all in st marlo or Brittany's kind of view um, so they're kind of Germans staring at Germans, looking pretty relaxed, I would imagine, for, for most of the war. But the West Coast, nothing that direction to be kind of hit Newfoundland or, or America. So this is uh, and available on our website. You can download this in mm -hmm. high resolution and have a good zoom in. Um, but it gives you a good idea of just how much is here. Um, we see kind of inland, uh, the clusters of the tunnels. Uh, we see battlefield headquarters um, and various bits here. Um, and this is the last one we found. So again, what we love sharing is if people find later maps issued by the Germans, please feel free to share it with us and we'll share it with as many people as possible. Um, this is the last one we've, we've been able to identify, which is around July 43. And tell me, Phil, because I'm, I'm intrigued to know what your opinion is about this, is that there's obviously, from the German point of view, a strategic reason to have defences there. You know, it's off the coast. They're defending the coast. So, of course, you want to defend what you have. But how much of it is also because it's the only part of the British Isles that were occupied? How much of it is It's like the Russians holding on to Stalingrad longer because it is Stalingrad, because it bears Stalin names? How much of this is kind of a personal thing? It's a statement from the Third Reich to Britain saying you're not going to get your your part of your territory your back. how back. much of it is a statement I, th I think that's that i'd say 80 percent. like it, it it's wow. ridiculous year one you kind of see an appropriate number so you're about 1700 troops on jersey to 40,000 islanders who are predominantly farmers uh they're not military trained like the french it is a civilian population um it, and it's the about 41 late 41 there's an order that comes out that changes the dynamics you know it's around the in the Battle of Britain, you have Dr. Fitz Todd who appears here. He comes to the Channel Islands. He's well documented. It's kind of his dream. I mean, the way I kind of, I guess, sell it, not sell it, but explain it to people on tours is I kind of describe it as this, the, this is your show house in a housing estate. This is yeah. going to get your buy-in. So I think there's an element of them showing off to Hitler and the Nazi regime of what they can achieve in a small scale obviously planning to do this from Norway to Spain, it, it's a lot bigger um, wall, but here it's kind of, they're at their peak of, of building. 
um you know but it's just over the top it's you know when you stand in normandy it's miles between resistance nests at time they interlock in fire but here it can be two three hundred meters apart um wow. and you've got high ground support as well as 16 artillery batteries that can pepper any coastal area it's it's over the top by a huge level but it's also kind of wrong um because of their confidence level of holding france the clusters on the wrong side of the island for them so all these heavy fortifications they're building are all facing on the atlantic side and the southwest side whereas ultimately american forces are going to be 12 miles off our east coast um and it's a contrast that if you're standing on our east coast you can picture some of these fortifications are in wooden huts and trench systems and if you're on our west coast they're in two meter reinforced fortress strength bunkers so it's not a finished product either it, it, it kind of never gets completed correctly um but for a period of time i think it's it, it's it's definitely that propaganda aim of mm. you're not getting back and this is what we're capable of um but i think there must have been someone in british or american intelligence looking at the reconnaissance photos and just laughing to themselves thinking they yeah, keep building here this is fantastic you know we're going to yeah. be 30 mi miles across the sea where you've got no anything similar to this um, so we've got like a couple of Normandy. questions coming in already, Phil. Just, we'll, do, we'll deal with them. So, so yeah. Ian Carr is asking, uh, which senior Nazis came to view Jersey work? So during this kind of propaganda phase of the, the show house, that I like that analogy a lot. I'm going to use that myself. <laughs> is Are there any kind of key Nazis or, or part of the Todd organization coming to oversee this? Clearly, if you've got that amount of concentration, Signal magazine are going to be going there, taking lots of footage of bunkers and you know, and, and the, the, the size of casemates they're building. But any senior figures when? Uh, Todd's about the most senior that went out of the kind of Nazi circle. Uh, Todd, before he passes uh, away, I think in 42, uh, comes regularly. The building reports are kind of going back into Hitler um, uh, on a monthly basis. Um, there are some more senior Germans that appear, but I don't recognize their names. They're, not, they're more on the infantry side, more than right. the construction side. But I think it's, it's Todd's. I don't think when Speer takes over, he has the same passion for this i okay. think one it's not his project and two i think hitler by this point is probably obsessing on the v2 sites and the v3 potential weapons right and perhaps spear um, just wasn't the fish and chips guy he didn't he didn't appreciate yeah. jersey's culinary delight so he went That's yeah it. whatever yeah and Maybe. another question from david is asking and this is a valid one because we talk about normandy being a lot you know 40 percent Aust troops defending the beaches what types of troops were stationed on jersey were they wounded not fit for frontline duty in russia uh, what type of garrison troops? Indeed, what nationality were the majority of them? Yeah, um, it's an interesting one, that one. Um, it starts off with 216 Infantry Division and moves into 319 Infantry Division. Uh, predominantly German. Uh, they are older than the average frontline troops, so you're kind of seeing an average age uh, between late 20s, early 30s. Uh, only one on Jersey anyway, I'm, I'm speaking of here. Uh, one Ost Battalion here, that's it um the rest so it, it's predominantly germans um just at a slightly older level uh not many injured germans um like you hear the stories in kind of norman areas mm -hmm. but it's not going to be dissimilar to 352 infantry up in, in and 709 uh it's going to be a similar setup just bigger um just bigger and they're not going to need to have much mobility because on an island of that size with that amount of fortification it's not like they're going to be having to you know run miles inland to man somewhere from somewhere else they're obviously going to be located in very close uh, proximity to their positions they're manning so being in your late 30s or 40s isn't going to make a big difference in that situation but anyway i'll hand it back to you to keep us taking us through these slides and folks keep those questions coming it's a great great um um show for this kind of um interaction so keep the questions yeah, definitely coming. please so um so yeah so looking at the map there that kind of <laughs> gives you a good idea of, of the setup i like maps i think they're the mm. easiest way to see things um now i'm just going to run through some slides of photos of bunkers just to give you some various types now there are a lot on jersey um we find out if, if you've visited normandy and Nor norway and other places there's they're everywhere right it's just in jersey it's literally 300 meters apart and you get to the next big cluster um so top left searchlight bunker top right artillery uh, 105 millimeter uh jaeger stands bottom left with a shotgun looking down onto the beach and uh another one to the bottom right and this is kind of just standard um you know for the the folks that love the bunker construction and and 
and uh, the bunker exploring. You know, a lot of these have been sealed since the late 40s. Uh, some are still open. You can explore them without the need of a guide, but they can be tricky to get hold of. So we'll do our usual, be cautious if you're exploring mm -hmm. bunkers mm -hmm. and you come to Jersey without permission. More likely because you don't want the Coast Guard to have to come and rescue you. That's uh, <laughs> the main thing here. Um, but they're also disguised pretty carefully. So the bottom right here we see, this is an observation tower that's been built on the top of a mill. So reconnaissance picks it up, but it's hard to tell what it is. There was a mill there before, and it's very crafty camouflage that we see. Some of them are just blatant, and others are like this, where um, you would have some issues dealing with it. Um, and um, and of various types. I mean, you can imagine that the schematic book of what the organization Todd could have built, they must have just sat here and just gone, I'll have three of these, 97 of these, 27 of these. And just been like kids and toy shop it's it's such a waste of engineering in a fantastic way like each one of these sites is going to save more lives than it will take because it's not going to see any action um, we don't need the allied forces to take it we won't need to bomb the civilians around it and the germans will survive because they're not in any action um, but again we look at these sites we have to bear in mind it's not built in an appropriate way you have slave labor there you have german contractors working with the organization todd um, that is the horrors of it and around it you've got forty thousand in jersey island is being held hostage for five years um, mm -hmm. and hindsight's great we can look back and think everyone won the lottery they had a greater chance of survival but if you're germans 12 miles off the american lines in the wooden shacks they had and not these big fortress bunkers i guess you probably wouldn't think the same and um, for the poor islanders never knowing when this will end it's 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 the other side of it we forget so we'll bring that back and forth but it's just uh, you know sometimes everyone gets excited with the concrete and we forget about the people all the way around it yeah, um yeah it's a couple of observation bunkers here so top left um kind of a standard one on our north coast these are kind of light constructed observation platforms but they're absolutely everywhere so they're watching the entire view of the coast so you can imagine for for three years it's quite quiet and then after the d-day invasion it's the battle of normandy they're going to watch for those three months um, and be very aware of of where it is a couple of the artillery guns so a 15 centimeter and uh, a french 15.5 on the bottom left and a german 15 centimeter at the top right and uh, and these are some of the observation towers as well so the top left and the bottom right are two mar marine palestans um uh, basically naval um, direction and range finding towers. Um, they plan nine of these. You'll find them in the other Channel Islands as well. They only managed to complete three of them, but they are huge structures. Um, and then bottom left, we have one of the Atlantic wall defense bunkers that kind of effectively just protects the wall. It just looks down the wall and stops anyone from coming near it. Um, has both a check. A uh, 4.7 centimeter artillery gun and a heavy machine gun mounted inside that monster with two meter reinforced concrete. No. So, so one word, Phil mm. materials. I mean, yeah. we talk about the difficulty by 43 and early 44 of getting stuff to Normandy, but at least you haven't got to cross a body of water. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll state the obvious. I mean, Jersey obviously had some kind of construction background of its own because it was obviously building its own houses and roads so there's there's but clearly most of this stuff is going to be brought in there so how on earth did the germans overcome that headache of getting everything they needed from mainland france to jersey yeah. <laughs> um so every type of ship that can be used is bringing stuff over on a daily basis for about a solid year and it, it, it is immense amounts um some of the fortifications had their own harbors built around them so we have a, a castle in the bay here called elizabeth castle and you can actually see for the reconnaissance photos and build bridge structures to bring all of this material in um they've got quarrying going on and there's 16 tunnels being built so you have an aggregate being produced locally uh as well as them setting up a railway network um to effectively bring this stuff around um, but yeah, multiple ports, daily um, shipping routes, bringing both labor, um, materials. Uh, and I would imagine, I'm not an expert on this side of it, but this is all coming from the other occupied countries as well. So this is, uh, I think, you know, a lot of questions were asked on tours of how much did it cost? And I honestly don't know if anyone can ever answer it because the labor organization Todd are using slave, prisoners of war, forced labor. You have German constructors who are receiving money from local occupied countries to build 
fortifications to defend them from an enemy they didn't have um as well as it being you know very hard to to pinpoint it but and again i have no evidence of this but i've been told multiple times by multiple people much more knowledgeable than me that anywhere up to 15 percent of all the available cement in the europe ended up in the channel islands and you know only when you're here you kind of get an appreciation that that, that probably is true um it, it, there is a ridiculous amount um and but yes, and when you consider ship, already phil when you consider in the early part, well, 42 period, how much concrete the Germans are putting into U-boat pens, and eventually the U-boats are no longer the threat because they just haven't got the U-boats left. So they'd already pumped millions of tons of concrete in that. Then, possibly, as you said, the 15% of Europe's concrete is going to the Channel Islands where there was never an invasion. It does begin to un answer the question why the fortifications in Normandy in 44 were not finished. But you, you made a very good point there, that people love to focus on the concrete, and I when you there's those bunker magazines you can buy in Normandy where they always have the cool big sexy bunkers on the covers they always have the finished ones with the big guns and the big observation what they don't show you is all the unfinished ones all the ones where they'd only put the footings in but never finished the bunker now you're beginning to understand just how thinly they had spread themselves to third Reich to try and do and they're still battling the russians on the uh, soviets on the eastern front they're still in fighting in italy they're still fighting in yugoslavia and they're trying to do this from norway to the spanish border it, it's it's no wonder they came unstuck and never got it finished yeah yeah and here on our west coast where they think the invasion would be it's fair to say almost it is fairly complete unlike other areas you really uh, you were saying it before you know, if you make something that obscenely uh, dangerous to come in, you just you know, use engineering to come somewhere else. Uh, anyone landing on our west coast um, it would be in serious danger. Um, there isn't any other way of dealing with it. Uh, the terrain as well, you have huge amount of distance between the high ground and the, the landing kind of areas, as well as a completed Atlantic wall. Um, not sections missing, not bunkers uncomplete. They're all facing the right way they're all armed and ready to go it's just lucky that it's never needed um and i think with all these things every bunker here every piece of material every you know gun every soldier is is suddenly nowhere near that battle of normandy um and thirty-three thousand german soldiers i don't think it would change the battle of normandy or d-day or any of those things i think it just costs more lives yeah. um, it just means another hour of fighting on those beaches another two to three weeks of fighting elsewhere. When we look at kind of fortified areas like St. Malo, um, which is a similar, if you're up in the Citadel in St. Malo, you get a lot of Jersey vibes of the construction there and how well it's done in a small scale. Um, but that's holding, I can't remember offhand, is it two weeks worth of fighting down mm -hmm. at St. Malo mm -hmm. to try and free that or stop it from being active, let alone the islands off it. Um, so when we look at our west coast it's 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 the st marlo bunkers repeated probably 10 times um mm. so yeah it's um it's a crazy amount of stuff um but thankfully on the wrong side of the island and uh, nowhere near normandy well brilliant but, but now we're coming to the to, to your role in this because the, the the analogy i'm going to use in terms of what we can see in those photos is that we're going to kind of see in the tip of the iceberg because what obviously remains at atlantic wall are the obvious pointy sticky up bits that are sitting outside the cliff faces and things like that but what is less visible is what's below the ground the foundations the footings how thick the you know you can't see from looking at a bunker from outside how thick the concrete is you can't see the 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 the, the, the construction techniques you cannot see the difficulties involved there and this is where you're your incredible work with the 3D modeling and the scanning and things. So I'll, I'll let you kind of explain what you do yourselves. But you're not just, as I do, standing in front of a bunker, getting my phone out and going, oh, there's a bunker, taking a photo and putting it on Twitter. You're going to a level massively beyond that. And that is that's 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 the important thing. And that's why, you're frankly, you're a guest on the channel. So uh, over to you to explain your project. Yeah, so, um, so very nicely put. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we've got kind of four approaches to, to how we research the sites, photography, videography, um, historic research, and then LIDAR, which is is the the, the new uh, piece of kit we've got. Um, now, it's been available for ages, but it's not at a level where small little organizations like the three of us can use. Um, so we're starting to use probably technology that's been around for 20 years, but it's become available or at least affordable by us. Um, so... Um, 
it's literally light detection and ranging is what it stands for a lot of people thinking kind of laser and things like that it has lasers in it has uv light in it has lots of complicated things uh, and lots of nerdy things but what it's effectively doing is it's measuring points and then overlaying the photo that we would take with our phones on top of those points um and the ability to store it in the cloud means we can share it with everyone fairly easily um, and uh, a couple of images below on the screen here. So the bottom left is one of the tunnels, uh, one of our projects called HO19, and that's in its pure raw form of, of like, what the cloud point basically, but the data dots that have produced that image. To the bottom right, which is uh, a Jaeger stand here, a hunter kind of bunker basically with a 10.5 centimeter gun. But you can see the interior layout. So it does a few different things. Now, for us as explore or digital explorers, what it's allowing you guys to do is, is to walk through it like a street view or pick it up like a doll's house. Um, so the nerdy stuff behind the scenes means we can measure every wall. We can check for um, any movements in the structure. We can get down to a micro level. Um, for the research side of it, what we're also using it for is to document any graffiti. If there's any trace of a slave worker or a forced laborer who's written a mark or left anything, we can record it. Equally, if there's German graffiti there and other things, we can record it digitally. If there's a unique feature of a bunker, then it can be recorded as well. Um, in Jersey, a few bunkers have been destroyed over the many years. Um, you make way for roads. Um, they've become unsafe or um, protection hasn't been given to them correctly. Um, but it was kind of an annoying bit that it existed and no longer does. But this kind of technology, if a bunker's at risk, if we can get in and scan it quickly, there'll be a digital model of it forever, which we think is pretty important. Um, whether you like them or loathe them, um, these bunkers are a part of history you know, and keeping a digital record will really help. Um, now we're gonna try and do a live look through a bunker. Um, this bit we've not tested, um, but it should be okay. So we're going to give it a go. It, it'll it'll work. Go give it, have a we'll little fix. phone. It'll work. Yeah. That's it. So just bear with us one second. And folks, uh, Phil may, may be too humble to say, but as I said earlier, the links to Phil's website are there. You can help with booking tours when you visit D Jersey. You can donate. You become a member of their team so you can help financially because as people have said there, this this costs money. This this equipment is not is not cheap. So that, so Phil's going to kind of share his screen. Oh look, we're there several times now. So this is the kind of stuff. And I urge you to go and go to the website and do this on your own, folks. But it is extraordinary stuff. But we're going to do a walkthrough now, and um, it'll be really cool. So um, now, Paul, I've just dropped my video of us. Um, so do I can't see that now. Can you can you see my screen? Okay, I can see your screen. Yep. Yeah, you just need to kind of change the size of the window a little bit. But yeah, is it a little bit too big? It was it was it was too too long. You need to kind of drop it, make it deeper, if possible. Okay. And I keep a bit more more than that, more than that. Uh, That's as deep as I can go. Okay, that, 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 that'll, that'll work. And then, then yeah, yeah, just click on click on it, and we'll show people a walkthrough. So which which okay. one do you want? So this, folks, is what you can do, and I'll let Phil explain more, but you can literally go straight in on their website, and you can do this yourself. You're controlling the camera. You can walk through it. You can look left. You can right. Look right. It's, it's as good as being there without without having wet feet and hearing a you know, voice <laughs> echoing and, and seeing bat, bat shit uh, jumping yeah, down. Yeah, it, it's the safest way to do it, but you will lose the experience of getting your everything of dirty and worried about getting locked in. Um so, um, and yeah, and folks, just, just very quickly, if you go onto our website um, and you come down into our projects and 3D bunker scans, you will go straight to a list of all the bunkers we've got in 3D at the moment, the region, and you can just hit view 3D scan to do what we're doing. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, so a couple of options as well. Um, bottom left, I mean, if you've got a VR headset, you can literally use this with a VR headset and go straight into walking around as if you're in there. Um, Oculus headsets like that will work. Um, it, it's quite, <laughs> it's, it is um, very good, um, but expect to get scared if you get lost in some of these bunkers in the dark. Um, you can pick it up as a floor pan and effectively we can, double click into any area of the bunker and it will immediately take us to where we are and you can see here this is uh one of the crew rooms within this bunker complex 
and using your mouse keys you can then walk around it um i've got a lower internet setting at the moment just for the stream um but you can see we're we're working our way through and you can see this one's not in the greatest uh condition uh this bunker is, was only open for about a week before it sealed again the last people kind of in here i'd say were the 1980 rockers um using it for partying um but you can wander around the corridors have a look around at various bits the nice thing is being able to see it as a doll's house and it gives you a better appreciation about how big these sites are so the one we're looking at here is called battery molka it's a four gun naval battery uh that never was completed um so for instance the um, circular position here this would be above ground where the gun should be and this chamber going all the way around the circular position would be where they loaded the uh, projectiles they had um projectile hoists that would send them up so there's one decaying here and from the recess behind us here they could load using the hoist and it would go above ground to the gun position um but the germans built four of these and the guns never arrived so it's another example of engineering that doesn't really help them too much but helps us massively so these guns um they planned i think there were 15 centimeter ships cannons were due down uh for the navy and it just never happens so the 3d scan allows us to capture it in the doll's house um and you can see the long corridors um, or trenches or tunnels depending on how you see these things uh running through the site um but in the simplest terms we can then drop at any point and go straight back into the walking mode and look at the walls etc this one's a challenging site because we have little light inside so what we're trying to do and there's normally two of us or at least two of us doing it is we're kind of lighting as much as we can as we go along um a site like this to add in any main power is almost impossible um right. and how long would it take ballpark to scan a position like this one are we talking hours days yeah this is about four hours work here um and um the way it kind of works is you're scanning about a meter ago so you'll you'll take your scanner will it spins around um for a meter's worth of data and then you'll move it forward and then forward again and you'll keep doing that until you complete the um as much as you want to see really mm -hmm. um because we're beneath ground we don't have to worry about um uv light uv light's a bit of a problem at the moment with the version we've got it doesn't like it so much so this gives us quite a crisp image to play with um as we came through and, and tell me uh, and, and if, i suppose if this is a crap question obviously like myself you grew up reading the books about the atlantic war with the diagrams with the plans with the footings how much did scanning it a kind of prove the books wrong and b what did you learn by actually being able to make a 3d model because obviously you're working in a more complete environment than just looking at diagrams were there any kind of wow moments when on some of these sites you went wow we, we really didn't know about this and look how it works is is that the kind of thing that you're discovering yeah there's an element to that i think it, it's as soon as you start to see how thick the walls are and the gaps between the the walls um uh you start to get an appreciation of how thick these things are um i don't think there was too many wow moments other than um uh, it's just such a vastly different piece of technology to to a book right so mm -hmm. schematics in a book are fantastic uh, and love them to bits but this suddenly brought in the photo imagery on all the walls um and we could drop in and what it gave us an ability to do is if we were only in a site for say three hours uh, we can come back to that site digitally now and walk around it for as long as we like um so it was just a, a bit of a game changer like that like to document a bunker drawing it and measuring it uh, you probably get an hour um and then you're going to need to ask the landowner to let you back in um and with this we could take two hours but we'd never need to come back um and we can produce multiple um bits of work from it um so for instance we're looking at a, a jaeger stand here this is um the gun from the outside so we can have a look on the outside and transition straight into the inside and we're able then to look around it so for instance this one retains its original directional board above the gun 
Um, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we're losing. I mean, in the 20 years I've been guiding in Normandy, there are bunkers I literally use better point out markings, uh, range distances, paintings that time has just taken away. And and it's a pity that, I mean, there are photos that exist of some of these bunkers 30 years ago, but, but literally the landscape we're looking at is eroding the time. And some may say it's a good thing the German bunkers are eroding because they were they stand what they stand for is the Third Reich and oppression and evil. But they're still, as you said yourself, Phil, there's still this, they are part of the history and understanding what they built helps us understand how the Allies were able to, to defeat this evil. And so understanding the mechanisms of these bunkers is, is important because who's to say whether in 20 years' time that, that those markings there will survive? I mean, the, you know, the damp can get in. I mean, and, and you can talk a bit later on, Phil, about about the deterioration of the bunkers, because obviously wind and rain does get in. There, things are happening. That these these sites are, are, are you know, you, I, I saw your footage a couple of days ago when you're going through them with all water in the bottom of the tunnels. Well, water and cement and steel, uh, it's it's not good. Um, so so what's happening with the with, with the, the 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 deterioration of some of these sites? Yeah, that's it. Um, now sites like this one, uh, slow deterioration. We're probably looking at it surviving another 100 years without any issues. Um, the government here has recently taken a view on, on doing some more work as well at seeing, you know, is there any concrete cancer? Are there any other things? Um, so these kind of sites have been built at such a standard that they're going to survive a lot. Right. But <laughs> there's always a but, right? We don't have everything to that standard. So if we jump into a tunnel complex, so this is... Uh, one of the tunnels on Jersey, um, the Germans named it HO19. Um, it's a strange site that underwent a lot of work for what it is. Um, so hopefully you can see the scale of it. Um, this is mined into Jersey granite, which is one of the strongest rocks we have. Um, there's at least a year of construction here. Um, and the tunnel is the best part of 150 meters deep. So it's they were achieving a lot bigger construction uh, in much smaller time frames. 150 meters deep. Wow. Yes. And how, how long, you know, left to right, what dimensions are we talking about? So we're looking, if we were to follow the main chamber down, um, or from left to right, it's 100 meters. But if we were to use the snake, you, you it's a little bit longer. So you're looking at the full 150 meters here. Um, and it is an epic tunnel. Um, so we kind of have, as you would expect, um, a bit of a cave going on. Um, so this was man made. Um, there was no natural cave here at all. Um, it was described often as, as unused, but what we started to find inside it, uh, uh, on the right hand side here, we can see where there was ventilation pipe work and the mm -hmm. scrap men removed a lot of it. And on the left-hand side where these wooden barriers are, uh, this would be all the lights running down the left-hand side of the tunnel. Um, and we think ultimately the Germans were using this for storage. Um, it's a very strange setup. So you can see how well, and this is we were talking about erosion. So this section here of the light board survives, but behind us, we lose it. And that's because mm. the water's getting through and um, it's not a concrete bunker. So wood's going to deteriorate. Um, to sites like this, we're constantly kind of working on two modes. The first one is keeping it dry so we don't lose any more of the traces. And the second one then is researching it. And it gets a bit of a blurry balance of ultimately becoming a maintenance nightmare versus us getting the work we need. So you can see we're about 100 meters in here, and this is it splits into two separate areas as well. Um, so when we started here, it was about 2015, this whole site was flooded up to ankle depth in areas, knee depth in other areas. And the last folk in here were probably the scrap men removing the metalwork uh, for value. Um, so there was a railway line running through here ventilation pipe work and um effectively it had been abandoned now the first section of the tunnel where we see i'm just going to zoom in we'll see here is a government site so you can see right. it's lined in concrete it's pretty sturdy sits near the harbor 
and a fantastic little workshop for the government here. Um, but as you get further in, we'll see we go into kind of granite. Bear with me one second. So we've got two tunnels, but they're not lined anymore. And that's probably due to the fact that the Jersey granite is probably as strong as cement in a way. Um, and they are working on a project here that, um, you know, it, it's designed to hide them in this hillside. This hill is about 40 meters deep of granite. So the main concrete section is supporting a road and then the unlined sections effectively into the hillside. So down here, um, the problem with the granite is it lets water through. So we'll mm. spend a lot of time removing that water. Um, now, I'm not sure if you can see it clearly, Paul, but you can see some graffiti on the wall here. Yep, yep. So this is the kind of stuff we all find here. So this is a huge piece of German graffiti. Um, and we have the word Reaper written here. And we can see it's kind of a, a drawing of a road. We're able to trace this back to Reaper Barn in Hamburg. And it's, it's, it's a fairly... A uh, well-known area um, for the red light district, and it seems that the Germans here have drawn a map of how to find it, uh, specifically highlighting Cafe Heinz there. So probably a popular area for the German soldiers to visit on leave. Um, but it's just sat on the wall. In this, so it's obviously park. some some sergeant had just got fed up with telling everybody <laughs> where to go on leave. It's a bugger it. I'm going to do a diagram. I'll do a he diagram. He got his his little paint set. And he said, "Here you are." So yeah. the be the best brothel is there. The best pub is there. Here's where you get off the 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 the, 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 the tram. Here's where you get off the road. What an insane bit of detail. Oh, um, and, amazing. And just to jump around a little bit whilst everyone's looking at this, and we have to balance all these views, right? So where we see German graffiti of brothels. Uh, they're equally sad of graffiti so this is not a um this is not a site that's well um it's not a health and safety site right if you're mining granite in an occupied country it's not going to end well um now what's interesting here is when we were talking about the the, the slaves and the forced laborers uh we've named this one the spanish tunnel so fundamentally within this site we just find lots of spanish graffiti uh, this one's a bit more sobering compared to the German one. So hard to see. And again, please come onto the website. And we've got some better photos there. But it says Louis A. Nell, 9th, 1913, Spain. And then beneath it, 27th of the 4th, 44. So this poor gentleman has probably died in the tunnel and his friends have hidden this memorial stone for him. It would have been directly behind German ventilation pipe works and not easily seen. So this is kind of the other side of it that probably means a lot more to us is that you know poor lewis has no records right he doesn't exist mm. as and stuff like this means he exists again right and he's then in our thoughts and throughout the tunnel we find various other bits and um, we try our best to document it in these scans i'm just going to see if i can get close hopefully you guys will see a little bit of writing yeah. on the wall here so franco and we can see counting here. This is the Spanish counting, probably rubble going back and forth. Um, then Granada, so the city in Spain. Right, we yeah. think here on the right, some signing of their names. So it's it's important for us to kind of save this and to document it well. Um, this, unlike the other piece of um, graffiti, is, is etched in dirt. It's just in dirt. It's not pickaxed into the stone it is just in dirt and there's an overhang of rock above it that just stops it from getting wet so it's the only reason it's kind of still around now so for us to scan this in a, a laser format into a super high resolution gives a lasting digital record um, that mm. otherwise will eventually be lost um, and this is what you were saying earlier phil about the mul the multiple uses this is doing because it's documenting on the one hand, simply it's documenting defences and what the Germans are building to, to, to keep the island secure. Secondly, it's the uh, exp explanation of the German economy and how they are wearing themselves into the ground, literally and figuratively trying to keep this stuff up and the amount of insane amount of materials they're putting in. Thirdly, it tells us about the Germans that were inside these things and what they were getting up to. And fourthly, and I think the most important of those four things, is the labourers who built it. So it's, re it's recording all those aspects of history, all of which are important, but from slightly different angles and reasons. And 
and, and uh, people are asking already. Uh, Bob is asking, um, does Phil and his team get any funding for their work? So we talked about <laughs> the fact you do tours. The, uh, the laugh yeah. there kind of gives it away there. But is there any kind of official money coming your way? There isn't. I mean, we get support in various ways uh, from the government. For one, we're in here, right? We're in this site yeah. and um, they're allowing us to do this work, um, which is fantastic. Um, but no, um, we, we don't qualify for any government funding and we haven't done for quite a while. Um, so we kind of thought to ourselves, look, we can get angry about that and get upset or we just do it ourselves uh, and just figure a way. And sometimes being told no is, is a good way to, to force you to, to move forward. Um, so no, so we, that's exactly when we kind of thought, well, why don't we use the money from tours? Why don't we invest back into this as a nonprofit? We don't want to be a charity. Um, but as a non-profit, it means that we can invest into this as long as it's going back into the World War II history. It will it'll allow us to remain as a non-profit. Um, so, yeah, so we invest back into it using the tours. So um, we'll run tours uh, throughout the week, throughout the year and uh, let people come and help us in these sites as well. We have a fantastic member base and we can't thank them enough. So a bit like yourself, Paul, we use, use Patreon to, to, to help fund other bits. Um, you know the calibration of the scanner the the website to hold this it all costs money each month just to maintain it so having folks on board there uh, and the great thing is they'll come and help as well um so when we get flooded we were talking about the flooding before before on the floor um so when sites like this flood um we've got a really great group of um, volunteers that will come down and help us man the pumps as it were and help us kind of preserve this and keep this mm. going so no to the government funding, but yes to the support in various ways from the government. Um, but we're here and able to share this with you guys. And for you guys to be able to use this for free, it's because of the folks coming on tours, the folks um, joining as members, and also the ability to keep the site dry so, so we can carry on. Well, and, and as I said at the beginning, and I'm going to tell the folks again, you know, those who are watching this, watching it live, and who are going to be watching it, you know, later on, please consider a first going to the website and having a look at these scans in proper detail where you are controlling the mouse yourself and b as you say consider becoming a, a patreon beca consider becoming a, a member of the, of the thing or, or going to jersey and just a, a, applauding and supporting this important work so um any other sites you want to quickly show us then then we can carry on yeah i'll give you one in contrast uh, to that tunnel um this is another site we're working on it's known as ho5 we're about 75 percent through so believe it or not we haven't actually scanned it all yet so this is the floor plan of it um described by the germans as a munitions tunnel by the end of the war uh one of the update reports um a very happy to explain to the uh, one of the commanders they're writing to that it's uh, able to hold 2,000 tons of munitions and it's already being filled. Uh, it consisted on their report of uh, five galleries of 68 meters depth and one gallery at 48 meters. Um, so this is a great way of seeing where the munitions are when the Germans are starting to run out of stuff. Um, so this tunnel is in St. Obens. Um, it's a harbor town and it is massive um so we'll come we'll jump into the hallway quickly so this is just the entrance hallway of this site it was an old british way british railway station or train depot uh, you can see the cave where the train ran mm -hmm. through um but this ended up being munition storage so along this far end gallery here we have three side tunnels just in this section here um now if we jump back into the floor plan and have a look at the main gallery as we look down this is how big <laughs> the main gallery is um it is huge uh twin railway line system inside hand carts not um effective uh, a railway or a train system it's all hand carts but this is just how big one of these recesses are holding the munitions and uh, this is the <laughs> this is the local bobsled team who use it for training um so some things you're going to discover today one is there's, a, there's a movie in the making there yeah we, at we, two we, we have the cool one, two. Bobsled team the jersey <laughs> bobsled team there there's a there's an idea for the ne the next big thing on netflix oh yeah and um so these tunnels are, are huge right and um we walk through them digitally now and you can just get an idea of just how much is going on uh, and this in World War II would have just been full of munitions, uh, one of five of these galleries. Um, and as always in World War II, 
exploring, you find some strange things. So this is an old freight rover we found abandoned inside it. <laughs> um, so, um, but again, munitions would have been in here. Um, and each one of these galleries effectively is holding a huge amount. Um, and we find it in various conditions. We find some original features inside. So we have some of the original German blast doors. Sorry, let me. So we can see here some of the original yeah. doors inside yeah. here. Um, and just this is looking down the other side of the gallery back towards where the bobsled team were. And um, it has, you know, some, as always with these things, it has some strange features. One is the ventilation shaft, and I'll just look up it here. <laughs> mm. So it doesn't give it justice. It's one of those you kind of need to see, but this is about 122 steps at a 45 degree angle, which leads up to the ventilation uh, opening, which brings air throughout the tunnel. Uh, it could double up as an escape shaft, but the mining involved of that alone is a hell of a feat. And we go back to that human suffering again. This is mm. slave labor driven. Um, one thing we're struggling to find in this entire site, um, and we're probably only halfway through the survey, um, is any trace of the workers. So we saw in the um, other tunnel, that graffiti, uh, the Spanish yeah. graffiti, the German graffiti, this is sterile. There is absolutely nothing in here so far. Um, but we hopefully will find it somewhere. Um, and then on the upside of this, um, when we're reusing bunkers, this is being used now as shooting clubs are in here. The bobsled team, we have a local um, bike hire company that stores bikes here. The trains that run up and down the coast are in here. So it's a fantastic use of this old Nazi megastructure. And I think if you're going to upset the dead Nazis, let's do it with uh, a bobsled team in there, their dear um, munitions. Yeah, tunnel. There's an irony there of yeah. somehow <laughs> just deserts. And, you know, I, I'm hoping the viewers are appreciating, as I am, that all the paradoxes here of the we can, on the one hand, kind of admire is not the right word, but be amazed at the amount of ridiculous engineering the Germans did here for, for as we realized for no real reason in that there was no invasion there we can we can be uh, uh, be appalled at the the conditions the slave laborers were 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 forced to work in but we can also be just be be um appreciative of of the fact that as you said yourself earlier all this work here essentially sell save lives every, elsewhere because the Germans that were building this weren't building defenses in Normandy, they weren't building defenses elsewhere, they weren't manning other sites elsewhere. So it's it's fascinating, uh, no pun intended, given they were looking at tunnels on mul on multiple levels. Um, yeah, uh, it's an amazing presentation. I'm thoroughly enjoying it, as are the view uh, the, the viewers. So. Um, so I think did you, I can't remember whether you discussed it at the beginning. Do we know how many slave laborers were, were, were brought? Because some were brought to Jersey from elsewhere, and some were were from the iron itself. Is that right? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one I'm not an expert of. We're learning a lot as we go. Uh, we've just pulled back. Uh, so one of the other things we like to muck around with with technology here is OCR. So we've been storing as many of the NARA files of the German records as possible. So. Right. There's been some numbers thrown around of over multiple books, multiple publications, and I've got a feeling that we don't really know. Um, I don't think there is a clear indication of how. I mean, when you look at the scale of the building here, it, it's immense. So you have German contractors employed by Organisation Todd to build these sites. Um, on top of that, Organisation Todd will supplement their labour with slaves and forced labourers. Mm -hmm. And if they're missing something, Organisation Todd is going to find it for them. Um, mm -hmm. I would say when we look at the organization Todd numbers, uh, it, it's close to 6,000 what they call foreign workers uh, at the peak in Jersey. Um, but it's unclear if that includes the German laborers that were there as part of the construction companies. Um, so it, it's something we need to look at and definitely a, a very good future uh, podcast to look at. Yeah, and, and um, indeed how many, it's not just the number of workers, it's how many hours were they worked, what were the it. conditions like, how how much were they fed, all those other things there. There's a whole there's a whole story beyond just the fact we can we as you said we can safely say they were built by slave labor, but exactly what that experience was. It's one of the things in Normandy, there are very few surviving accounts of anybody who worked building the bunkers. We have lots of accounts of those who fought against them coming up the beaches on D-Day, and we have the knowledge of the, who, what the Germans built when, 
But who the workers were, there's very, very little. I've discovered like half a dozen accounts in 20 years of, of, of looking for them. So it's one of the aspects of history that we are really lacking in. I guess a lot of these people from other countries, they weren't they weren't in a condition to write stuff down. Whatever happened to them, did they survive the war? Did they die somewhere else? But anyway, we are left with a real lack of, of, of accounts of slave laborers who are working, which is a shame. And I think so. And I think as well, we, we don't have a true account of who dies here um, to a great yeah. level. We have a, a, a graveyard here uh, and off the top of my head, I think there's around 130 uh, bodies listed there, including German OT workers. Um, they called it the Stranger Cemetery. It's where they, they buried them. But um, even when they were exhumed, so a bit like the Normandy uh, repatriation where you set up single grave sites, same thing happened here with the German mm -hmm. bodies. And they took the OTs with them and there were extra bodies found. So we know that there's counts. But at the peak, um, I think that's the interesting bit is we will be able to work out some of it because that, it sounds horrible, but there will be a number somewhere. There will be a shipment of people that records what's there. That's where we want to kind of look into is to try and get a more accurate number. And it's a mixed group as well. So we, we generally hear Russian, but it's, it's Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian. Um, Dutch, uh, the list goes on, uh, Spanish, as we can see with the other tunnel. Um, but it's all lifted out of the Channel Islands to be moved into Europe before they can finish here. Um, so I think the unfortunate thing is we just don't know where they go. For instance, HO5, the German engineering company involved there, um, who had the contract to build that big tunnel, um, they're off. And the next projects we can see them working on are the V2 sites, um, right. huge underground complexes. So those, I would imagine, and it's only an imagine at this point, is that labor going with them? Is that OT source with them? Or do they just go there and OT starts again? Um, but the other thing is, as you were saying before, the construction in Normandy is after this has happened, right? It, it's, it's going on. So I would imagine most of the withdrawn labor from the Channel Islands has probably ended up in either St. Malo or, or in Normandy. Uh, I think they're probably out there more than anything. It's the Seventh Army. It's the same same group that's responsible for the fortifications in Brittany, Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, Sark, and Normandy. So um, it might be out that way, but it's something we'd need to put further research in for sure. Not just us. Just yeah, uh, that story it, again. Like you said before, like we see this concrete, people get excited with the engineering level that's involved, but it's always better to see the human cost. Um, but ultimately, with the, the Channel Islands. It's a bit unique on Jersey, especially that this will save more lives than it will take. Yeah. Um, because that 2,000 tons of munitions not being in the Battle of Normandy is fantastic. That means there's one less day of fighting, right? No, definitely. And 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 Stuart Burbage is making the point that some of the Todd workers were salaried. There's the German yeah. hierarchy at the top. There's the slave laborers at the bottom. But in the middle, there is a certain level of kind of supervisory people who are from construction companies. They are people who produce cement or steel who are salaried. They are, yeah. they are, they're either German nationals working or they're from, from other countries. So there's, there's different elements of workers. that yeah. aren't. There's a good point there. Very good. And again, the Spanish though are forced, you know, these are men yeah. picked up by the Vinci government handed over to the Germans. I think Franco's regime says to have them as a guest, uh, they'll receive money. Right. Um, but we always see things differently in Jersey that you, you can't say no, right. It's not like they can walk off and find another job. Um, they're receiving something, which is great, but sometimes the salary reviews need some questioning um, because you receive something doesn't mean it's, it's worth anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but yes, right. but at the other level, you've got, you know, it is a German civilian construction company that's building it with their workers. You'll have engineers from Bosch, Draeger, AEG, all involved in this on top of when they need extra labor. That's where the OT kind of brings their stuff in too. Hmm. And and uh, Scott is making the point uh, about your scanning of, of, of ground level defense. Well, obviously, the, the priority in some ways is to get into these underground ones that are, that are just succumbing to water and age and time. But, you know, yes. you only use the percentage of the, 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 the bunker systems you've scanned. You've done some surface gun batteries. You've done some enormous. You've done long, yeah. uh, point to hawk as well. So we can be yeah. look at that. But. I'm I'm assuming I'm hoping the answer is going to be yes to this, but I'm assuming now you have some of this tech there. As you branch out, you know, you told you showed us that map of how many positions there are in Jersey. You can now go to other landowners and people who have these on their property and say, "This is the kind of thing we can do. It's not intrusive. We're not going to do any lasting damage. Just let us in there. We'll scan it." So. I'm because I'm assuming when you first mentioned lidar to some people, you had to run through just what the hell lidar was and yeah. what scanning is because 
if if Jersey is anything the same as normally, there have been people over the years who've trespassed in bunkers, trespassed in them. They, they, there's been damage, there's been graffiti. So if you're a landowner, you're not necessarily that keen on people coming in uh, and potentially damaging your, your locations you live and work at. So as you move forward with this, do you think it will be easier to persuade people to kind of let you in? Yeah, I think so. And it has worked already. We've had some great folks who have said, did you know we had a bunker? And we're like, no. And they've said, well, you can scan it. Because once we show them the digital side, we say, look, we won't put the image side on because you may have personal photos, things like that inside it. Um, the reason I say this is some bunkers in Jersey have become entertainment halls or um, home cinemas, uh, mm. bars, uh, wine cellars are very common. Um, so we'll go in and we'll use that and the photo we've got on screen now, the bottom left, using the cloud point, using the dots instead of an actual image on the right means we can share it with you guys, but perhaps we wouldn't be able to give you the, the view inside at this time. But right. we would have the digital record forever. Um, so it, it, it's definitely people are warming up. And like you said, gives us more of an ability to say, look, could we do this? This is what it looks like. Mm. Um, we're hoping as well with the government, if we get into a situation where a bunker could be lost for whatever reason, they'll let us go in and do this uh, like we've done in their sites already and then have that digital record. As it gets better and we're starting to play with above ground as well so we can link the two together, uh, we recently did something. It's on. I've done a very quick video and thrown it on YouTube just in case this came up. Um, there's a small little video clip of us um, using this technology at Point de Hop and we've gone in and scanned the observation bunker there and you can see it on our, our scan, but we've then gone to the next level of looking above ground and seeing the craters there um, and then mixing the two together. And it gives a very interesting um, perspective. And we are almost doing a digital drone flight where no drone was used. Um, and we're able to fly over the site and look at it. We'll be able to use that in Jersey as well. Point de Hoc is a, a much more uh, interesting place. And I don't mean that for the, the loss of life there or the battle, but just because of its structure, the craters there, um, and one thing we were quite aware of, um, it was going to be fenced off soon, which meant things yeah, like Yeah, and, and you're working with French authorities and, and, and American National uh, American Battle of Monuments Commission, so more more organisations to contact it. to get permission. And I think the Texas A&M have done some 3D modelling of Point du Hoc. But uh, Phil Bosworth is saying that no dope farms in any of these tunnels then, but I, that, but I have, <laughs> I will say there is a rather... There was a rather famous German commander on D-Day who may or may not have seen the fleet come through the coast through his bunker, Major Pluska. But one of Major Pluska's bunker is the local guy's porn stash. It, it has stacks of proper old 80s printed magazines six foot high up there. So uh, there, there's a Normandy bunker full of pornography, which is an interesting one. I haven't been there for years. I assume it's still there. There'll be a lot to move out, but that's something that I'm hoping you haven't discovered some poor guy's porn stash but anyway no. we've got two or three slides to finish off then we'll kind of do some more questions so um uh we'll let you finish off your slides and um yeah yeah and and really it's just as you've already said look ways to follow and see these scans you know we've seen it on the website just jump on the website it's it's a work in progress right when we're not finished this journey we're at the very start of it um we've got more time available to do more so we're pretty much on every social media um we're fairly big on facebook but tiktok Instagram, YouTube, TripAdvisor, the usual things, and Patreon as well. Um, so it's kind of, you'll find us somewhere, and whatever, we'll try and post to all, so whatever your favorite way of seeing this stuff is, hopefully we'll be able to share it with you in the various ways. Um, and yeah, that's it, really. That's it on the slides. We're kind of, um, yeah, no, thank you. Happy to answer any questions. And again, email us as well, and you can message us through, through Facebook and the various other channels if you've got anything you'd like to add or any bunkers you want us to have a look at or scan and when we're in normandy if people have sites that they'd like to see just just shout if we can get permission uh we'll happily do it we're we're normally in normandy about a week a month at the moment and we're trying to to kind of finish off some stories for us it's important to see the battle of normandy the three-month battle that is coming parallel with jersey as we're going down the coast and how that into racks with the islanders here there's little mm. things like one of my favorite stories is people here being able to pick up gi radio as in wow. music for the first time so instead wow. of hearing hitler's voice or you know the bbc and bearing in mind radios on jersey guernsey circle they all banned really um so to be able to hear music as a teenager i'd imagine or, or i picture my grandparents there listening to something um from world war ii instead of the droning tones of uh, propaganda um, so things like that we like to kind of follow it down but yeah please let us know
Yeah, and, and maybe there's some engineers watching who can give you some advice. There's people yeah. that have maybe got access to to, to, to Todd organization files. And I mean, Nick Lahure is watching, will be doing the commando show on Wednesday. He's working alongside, you know, but, but like yourself on these projects of the Channel Islands. Islands. The other thing I want to say is 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 that it's 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 a it's a showcase for the possibility of lidar and 3D scanning in our appreciation things. Having spent a day doing hedgerows, I'm now thinking how wonderful it would have to have a 3D model of the sunken lanes approaching San Lo, for example. So you could actually look at these because you can't see them from the surface from Google. Google Earth just shows trees, but you could go down these tunnels and start modeling it and putting them together and, and working out there. So there's lots more. There's lots more avenues for understanding warfare through what we can do with this technology. And it needs people like yourselves and your organization to, to do this stuff. So, um, um, I mean, obviously, what next is more bunkers, um, uh, hopefully yep. more funding, more things like that. Any big kind of tech things on the horizon, any kind of next levels you'd like to get to that would bring yeah. the next, the next, ability, the next uh, level of ability? It's every time we look at it, we're always shocked at what's coming around the corner. So um, upgrading our scanner is vital. Our scanner is about 10 years old. So one of the things we'd like to do is kind of get it upgraded. Um, what we struggle with with most of these scanners that we're using at our level um, is uh, sunlight. It interferes with the data. Um, so they've released a new one uh, which takes away that. So it uses a different type of scanner so we can get both indoors and outdoors on the same kind of equipment, which is really good. Um, so we're going to be saving for that. It's a it's a it's a very expensive piece of kit, um, but hopefully that will be the kind of next bit, and that will kind of change it completely because a lot of our things we have to wait till sunset, get an hour scan out. We'll be able to to go through. And where we were saying before about you know three or four hours to do a a complex like we saw on 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 the map, um, the time it's taking now the technology is advanced means that might be half an hour. It may be that we're walking mm. through it at a walking pace. And scanning it as we go uh, and technology is crazy so on my mobile phone now it has lidar and i'm kind of like well how different is that to our scanner and in fact when we were normally last week we tested it and it's pretty good it's not there yet but i can imagine in two or three years that you guys could walk around a bunker with your phone and do what we've just taken months and months and no, years isn't that, to isn't do. That it, it's crazy and, and, and the the other thing I have to I want to applaud you for on a kind of personal level is the fact you've put this information on the website. You haven't hidden it behind a paywall saying if you give us money, then we'll let you let we let you look at our important scans. You put it there anyway, and then and then anyway, and hoping people will like with my channel, you put it there free on YouTube and hope that some people go, you know what, it's worth bunging Woody a five or a month to help out with that. And the same thing yeah. with you because without naming any names, about 10, 15 years ago, I did a documentary where they lidar scanned a lot of Omaha Beach. But the, you know, they spent two days doing it all. But that information, I think they ended up with one terabyte of, of data or something like that. Is it they, they, they use the bits they use for documentary and the rest just kind of got deleted somewhere. It's like, well, you've done it now. Couldn't that have as a, an additional resource? Couldn't the website of the TV production company put it available somewhere or at least? Yeah. But no, it just got it either doesn't exist or it's hidden away. And it's it's amazing to me. That you're not only just doing it, but you're putting it out there for people to learn. Because uh, if you've just done this for your own reason, you're not sharing it with the world. So thank you very much for thank doing you. that. Yeah, it's good. And again, anyone watching, if you want anything, just just contact us. Uh, we have the data. If we can get it transferred to you, we'll happily do it. And it's the same with with the NARA files, things like that. Uh, obviously, if it's licensed to us, we've got issues sharing it legally. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in other things that have been declassified and completely open we're trying to build OCR technology where we can put a jersey in and then pull back any paperwork that has the word jersey or you know channel islands uh, obviously in german um and things like that so as that technology advances when you're saying what's next around the corner that's the other side we want to get involved with. we'd love it so you can come into the website throw in a phrase and get back all the german documentation all the english documentation involved in it because it will make researching so much simpler um yeah with an extent that, that, that you know that's the thing. When we talk about, you know, because I read a blog the other day about how expensive it is for museums to put digital archives on, but it's not just the scanning. That's obviously a main part of it. It's then going through and picking out all the keywords and making the indexing. It's so you can search the document. So it is OCR rec recognized. So you can say how many documents mention the figure of, 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 of Rommel, how many mention concrete or whatever it would be. So 
a digital a dig, a flat digital image is only one part of the story we need all that supporting tags and meter information to get the information so that's the next level there but we built we and, and Darren Little is saying that Andy Andy Chatterton who wrote the book about the auxiliary units in 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 the UK has been using lidar with some of the underground bunkers in 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 the UK there so that it's something that's happening there as well but we Brilliant. We will bring the things to an end, but what I'm going to do now is extend to you an invitation to come back in the future, either on Atlantic Wall week and do a week and do a deeper dive in one of these bunker systems, or just whatever your favourite German position is in the in Jersey, because we've only touched on the, the on the surface of this and indeed underground of this. And I feel there's a lot more uh, information we can we can pull from your your resource in the future. Yeah, so definitely. we'd be happy to come back. We'd Fantastic. be happy to have you. Yeah, happily do that. Brilliant. Well, I'm just going to take you off screen and remind people what we're coming up. So I'll take it for a second. So, folks, we continue our, our week at the Channel Lines. So tomorrow night is um, Duncan Barrett is coming on to talk about the occupation of the Channel Lines. So that's that the civilian experience, the arrival of the Germans, rationing, uh, camps, education, how it worked with the, with the authorities, all that, the liaison between the British and the Germans. That's all tomorrow. Wednesday, Nick is on, who's on. We're watching night talking about some of the commando raids. And third, I think we've got nothing. Then we've got Jilly Carr coming on. I think that's Monday talking about the uh, deportations. And then also either Monday or Tuesday, Eric Lee is coming on to talk about the 80th anniversary of Operation uh, Basel and the commando raid are there. So that'll be on the 80 years. So there's still more Channel Islands content. And then we'll do another week Sunday in the future. So again, uh, I'll remind you one more time, the information about Phil's resource, the Jersey War Tours, is in the description below. Go and find that. Go and spend many hours walking through these 3d models because if you're anything like me you'll 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 go there and then you'll realize two hours later you spent two hours walking through bunkers and you should have you should have been going to bed and doing and feeding the cat but anyway uh so brilliant uh phil it's been a fantastic to have you on i'm looking forward to speaking to you in the future and good luck with your Thank project you. i hope fingers crossed you get a few new patrons and a few new members as a result of this no, no, thank you it's really, really good thanks for the support and thanks for everyone for watching Brilliant. Okay, so this is it. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying we'll see you all again tomorrow night. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for your attention. Bye.